Hi everyone, welcome to the Empowerment Zone show. My name is Lina Khalife and I'm the founder of Sheep Fighter and I'm going to be your host for today. The Empowerment Zone focuses on highlighting uh, achievements of women and entrepreneurs, feminists and martial artists all over the world. Today I have two amazing guests from Germany, Sarah Barakib and Danny. Hey Sarah. <laughs> and Danny Koenig if I pronounce it right. Yes. <laughs> Who met in She Fighter Amman in Jordan five years ago and decided to bring She Fighter to Germany in 2019. They launched She Fighter Germany and they organized workshops and boot camps for women in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. Earlier this year, they founded a startup called China, Chin Kila Gear. <laughs> maybe, if, maybe if you say it right, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's even better. Chin Kila Gear, right? It's, okay. it's a um, clothing company and it's an athlete, athlete uh, clothing company for women. So please welcome Sarah and Danny. Yeah, that's my <laughs> way. <laughs> so that's how we start all the time, like welcoming the guests. And after that, I'll be starting for uh, any question with Sarah. So Sarah, you used to live in Jordan and uh, you moved to Germany after that. I think how many years uh, was it since you moved from Jordan? Um, I believe that was in 2016. So, oh, so it's um, what? Is yeah, it like four years? Four? Oh, four years so far. But it was the so, tail end of 2016. So more like three years. Years. Okay, that's that's really a while ago, right? So how did you, I mean, moving from Jordan and living all, you know, in Germany is going to be completely different. So how did you adapt with the situation moving from Jordan to Germany? Mm -hmm. um, well, I had actually been living in New York right before I moved to Germany. So, um, you know, I had first grown up in New York and then moved to Jordan. And that was a huge change. Um, a lot more difficult to adjust to that difference than when I moved from uh, the U.S. to Germany. So, um, but it was hard because I had just moved back home to New York and I was getting settled in and enjoying being home. And then, um, yeah, wedding plans happened. So, yeah, <laughs> ended up I mean, moving to Germany shortly after. Um, uh, was it hard uh, learning the language since you never spoke uh, German before? Yeah, never spoke it, never heard, never really, I didn't really know much about Germany. <laughs> so um, definitely the language is not an easy language. I mean, Daniela knows my struggles with German very well. Um, <laughs> Are you but, still learning? Are you still taking? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still taking classes um, or I have a language partner who helps me out. Um, mm. And, you know, I would say the language was the biggest struggle. Um, also, the culture, there is a different culture and just, you know, the idea that you're going to settle into a new place and you've got to get used to it. It's never easy. It can be fun, but the culture shock is always there. Yeah. But what tips do you give for people who's changing countries and moving to completely different country where they don't even speak the language? I mean, is there some tips that they can be part of the society a little bit faster? Yeah, not to be afraid of trying to learn the language. That was my problem for the longest time is being afraid that you sound stupid is what holds me back the most. Um, but also to be aware that there is gonna be that culture shock and you're gonna go through it. And there's gonna be a point where you're like, why am I here? I wanna go home and push through it nonetheless because if you just push through that little hard part then eventually you get the experience of learning a whole new culture and language. So it's worth it. Yeah, and do you recommend them not uh, being involved a lot in their communities? Like, for example, what I noticed when I was when I moved to Canada, you know, Turkish people tend to stay together, Arabic people tend to stick together, Chinese stick together, and they always don't like to mix with other communities. Is there something you notice in Germany, or is it completely different? No, oh, absolutely. It's even in the small town that I live in now, there's a Turkish community that's quite close-knit. Um, and it was the same in New York. I, I mean, we've got the different quarters where certain um, people of certain demographics live and they kind of stay close together. Of course, US is a different story, I think. But um, that is part of the problem is I was definitely hanging out more with international students in the beginning and not really integrating much with the German crowd. And that's what also held me back from learning the language and getting to know the culture better. 
Great, that's uh, that's amazing tips. I mean, definitely trying, trying even like to have friends who are who speak the language. That's yeah. very important. I mean, I it's crazy. I meet people here in Canada that don't even speak English. I'm like you, you live in Ontario, you know, like you live in Canada. You live, you have to speak the language, and then you find people in Montreal that don't even speak French. I'm like, how are you even living there? They just, it's so easy to stick to your community and just even have all the businesses are run in that community like i i would see the chinese uh, you know influence they don't even speak english and they have all these china chinese businesses running everywhere that you don't even have to you know learn english which is um i think it's uh, it depends on the person and how old they are and moving countries and how you know if they're gonna adapt or not but my uh my next question would be for uh daniela uh daniela tell us a little bit about your background i mean i think you're in the film industry right i'm a director yes i make documentaries oh great that's amazing um i started um I started, uh, you know, like auditioning for some acting and learning about directing movies and all of this, like just recently in Toronto. And it's interesting. It's really interesting. Tell us more a little bit about it. Is it um, challenging? Uh, it is challenging. It is um, because you're self-employed. So you have to start projects basically um, all the time. So when one film is finished, the other one should already be in development. Otherwise you hit that like low spot where your finances uh, drop down. So it's challenging because also documentaries are not, you know, they're not Hollywood, they're not Marvel. So less people watch yeah. it. Um, it is a difficult scene, but I, I love it. You work with people, you do, um, mm. it fascinates you. Um, so I can't complain really only about money, but you know, as long <laughs> as you do something that makes you happy, I think you're on the yeah. right path. Also depends on the exactly like um, I've I've done an act recently and the director was all over the place all the time he even changed uh, the way we need to act many times and so it was I'm like oh my god the director that just keep changing things <laughs> <laughs> but yeah was but it's show, right the but it's movie. Um, yeah, they're from New York, so uh, definitely it was. But um, directing is like telling a story at the same time. So the director needs to know more about the story and the scripts and everything, right? Yes. Okay, that's that's interesting because it's a storytelling at the end of the day. So it's, it's really good. So uh, tell me, how did you meet Sarah? <laughs> that's like... It Very was fate, um, but when I met Sarah during that time, I was uh, shooting my first um, cinema documentary in Jordan about a group of female plumbers in Amman and Salt. Um, so I, because I was training kickboxing in Germany before, um, and I was spending a lot of time in Jordan, I looked for a place where I could train, and I found Chi Fighter, and it amazed me, the whole concept. So I uh, walked in there, and the whole... Um, I caught the fever. I caught the she fighter fever. And um, I don't know if it was the first time or the second time I was in Jordan, but I took a class, silver class, and I was taught by Sarah. And then we just started chatting and uh, she said, so, so where do you live in Germany? And I said, you wouldn't know it. It's a very small town. It's called Weimar. I studied at the university and her eyes got so big. She was like, what? I'm going to move there soon. And that was, it's a crazy coincidence. And the next time we met was in Weimar in uh, my uh, shared flat with my roommates and we had a dinner party. So, mm, that was so, uh, so Weimar is uh, located uh, north, south, so like where in Germany? Pretty much in the middle. In the middle. Yeah, it's a university oh, town, very small. So it's, it's definitely fate. <laughs> I mean, when sure both... about that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely is like destiny bringing you together. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm really happy for both of you. Uh, but uh, Sarah, tell me more about your definition of like feminism. I mean, what is what's really feminist really means? And is it like, uh, does people hate the word in Germany or uh, because, you know, it's a lot of people hate uh, the word feminist, uh, even in the Middle East and in Europe. Um, it's just people think about it in a different way. But what do you think about feminism and uh, how is it different from between your, you know, like the Middle East or and uh, Europe? Um, it is a good question if people have that same stigma around the word feminism here. I'm not entirely sure. That's probably a better question for Danny after, but um, 
Definitely. I grew up like being careful around that word, because if you said you were a feminist, then you get attacked by all these guys who are like, what do you, what do we need feminism for, blah, blah, blah. Um, but definitely as I've grown older, I've gotten rid of that fear and that embarrassment or that, you know, need to defend myself and just very simply say, I am a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I believe anybody who believes that women deserve equal rights and it's their it's not like a privilege, but it's a right, and they have that right to be treated equally, then you're a feminist. Um, so to me, that's what it means is that I would love if future generations were not, for example, raised differently um, when you're a girl as to opposed to when you're a boy. Uh, you know, I've got five brothers, so <laughs> uh, the way that I was raised was very different from how they were raised. And it was not just frustrating, it was infuriating. It's like, why am I being told what to wear? Nobody cares what they're wearing. Why am I being told I can't go to this university because there are men there? Why aren't they being told that? You know, And that was maybe more of the Jordan perspective, living in Jordan and having um, a father with an Arab background. Mm -hmm. And I thought for the longest time that you know this inequality is just because of the culture of my dad. And then moving over here and, and, you know, seeing my friends in the U.S. as well, the issues are different, but the issues are still there. Um, so equal pay and equal um, opportunities, like all these things still exist um, mm. abroad as well. So it's not like, I think there are different degrees and there are different levels. Um, so maybe women in Europe now are fighting for equal pay, um, whereas women in the M Middle East are still in some areas fighting for the right to education. Um, so it's both at the state level, it's at the family level, um, so many different uh, environments where women are not treated equally. And yeah. that's why it's super important to continue this fight. You know, what I realized uh, also moving to Canada, um, it's just lack of opportunities for women. So they always, for example, prefer men who work in IT, tech, software engineering, and they never even try to interview women. Um, they don't, um, that's why we, we don't see a lot of women in the workforce because they are not, even if they do not put the gender out there in the, in the job description or like in the vacancy, but they prefer men and they hire men faster than women. And most women struggle really to find, uh, jobs or either they go into jobs that mostly is for women, like, for example, secretary or something that, you know, it's like mostly like, okay, we want to hire women, especially like on a reception. Um, but even if it's like Canada is like one of the countries that is, uh, you know, like big on, you know, gender equality, it's in the politics uh, and with uh, human rights, but there's still a lot, <laughs> you know, I've seen it here. It's like, uh, uh, also men feels like privileged to you know tell women because they come from different communities and it's a land of a lot of immigrants so can you imagine they bring in the culture here like for example um, which is something good and at the same time it needs like the not the next generation but the third generation to be can like re you know what I mean like to implement in the society but I understand the differences with Jordan um they don't, uh, they don't, of course, give a lot of opportunity for women. And most women work in like bank sectors or schools or because it's like until 3 p.m. They, they, they have to go back home and then take care of the family. Right. So, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely I, I hired like hundreds of women in Jordan. So I know exactly how they struggle. And if the partner said you're not allowed to work, especially if it's like an evening shift. So they have to uh, listen to that. But Danny, tell me. Um, about your definition of feminism and how is it in Germany? Um, I mean, referring to the definition, I pretty much agree with, with Sarah. Feminism is uh, gender equality. It is that women are allowed to do the same things that men are allowed to do, that you're basically free. Like you have a freedom of speech, you have a freedom of opp opportunities. That is feminism. But the word is very like negatively connotated in Germany as well people are not happy when you say you're a feminist. They associate it with like radical feminism, with, um, I don't know, like it's it's weird. I, I think Germany mm -hmm. is very old school in that term and it still uh, needs time for this word to, um, 
to be perceived in the right way. Um, when it comes to opportunities, I mean, Sarah already said it, it's different issues here, but we still have issues. Um, for example, in craftsmanship, like when you want to work as a woman, as a, for example, a, a roofer or a woodworker, and the companies make it very hard because the rules are when you employ women, you have to have two different bathrooms. So most of them just don't want to um, don't want to take that challenge. It's too expensive. So they just don't employ women. It's stuff like this. And the percentage of women working in like craftsmen, uh, craft women <laughs> and jobs in Germany is super low. It's, I don't know, it's 20 percent or something. So the access is pretty bad, I think. The pay is, there, there's no equal pay. Um, and still there are problems that when you have a baby, for example, there are so many regulations, not enough support, and a lot of companies just don't want to employ you because you're a certain age. So mm -hmm. you're in your 20s or 30s, and they think, oh, you could have a baby. Um, and then they have to pay you for a year, right, when you're at home. So yeah, there are um, still a lot of problems, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, sometimes also what I noticed, like if you have a support system, like in the Middle East, they have this support system where if the woman has, let's say, she delivered babies and she want to go to work, she can leave the child at a mother's house. <laughs> I don't know if it's similar in Germany, <laughs> but I mean, the family always help with the, keeping the baby until the baby can, you know, leave and go to school, <laughs> be completely independent. But is it the same, Daniela, in Germany, like women uh, tend to depend a lot on their parents when they, they have children? Um, in general, not. You take them to Kita or kindergarten until they're ready for school. So um, you bring them there eight in the morning and then you pick them up in the afternoon. But um, in Germany, like the, the family relations are not- Or never pick them up, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that used to exist 24 um, seven kindergarten, um, but back in the GR. So that was 30 years ago. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but the family relations are not as tight as in Jordan. When, you, when we're 18, we move out and it doesn't matter if we move far away or not so far away. So that's the biggest, like one of the biggest differences I, um, I witnessed when I was in Jordan because families are so close, they support each other with the kids. And I mean, that has pros and cons, of course, but in Germany, it's definitely not that way. Mm. Um, uh, I received like this comment on um, how, like I'm thinking how men feel like so privileged in the Middle East just to tell a woman what topics to speak about, even on social media. So I, I received this comment like recently from that guy in Jordan. He's like, oh, why don't you like, Middle East is not one of the worst countries. Why don't you talk about other countries like Canada and North America? Why are you highlighting the Middle East? It's exactly like telling a woman what to say and what topics to talk about. So I'm like, well, my guest happened to be from the Middle East, but I have a lot of, you know, but I'm like, why I'm even giving him, you know, uh, like explanation about like he, that's how like men feel so privileged to tell a woman what topics to talk about. And they're always worried about uh, women's voices, like speaking up or not. So I was like, I'm not going through that conversation. And he's hired by like this kind of UN uh, organization that was a shock like how did they even hire him but I'm, I'm not surprised because I've um, I've done like one of the it was you know in November there's like the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence you know that you're aware of it it's I think between like the 23rd of November until like the 12th the 10th of December so during these 16 days um, you know the the UN uh, just provide a lot of training for for you know, United Nations staff, everything about diversity, inclusion, women, uh, LGBTQ, everything. So I went in, in Jordan to provide the training for, it was a uh, UN, something, the food, uh, the food sector, like United Nations for food and something. So I provided the training for about, fem like not even feminism, it was like about women need to stand up for themselves and learn self-defense, but, um, the staff started leaving in the middle of the presentation. The same staff that was hired by UN in Jordan, they're like, we're against this, what is this? Like, is she trying to tell, like, to tell us men that, you know, we cannot protect our women? So, and then I had like, it was so embarrassing that everybody left the presentation 
and they left me all alone. Even the staff, everybody left me there. So disrespectful because they just did not agree with my topic. I'm like, how do you hire those people to work and represent diversity and gender and feminism in Jordan? Like you need to really, really be selective with the staff. So moving on to, <laughs> because we can talk about Jordan forever, moving on to Shifa to Germany. Tell, tell us more about it. Maybe Sarah can talk about it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, she fought her Germany as soon as I knew that Daniela was in Weimar and like reached out to her, we stayed in touch. And I think it just kind of happened with both of us at the same time where there was just growing frustration over women's issues that we kept reading in the news. And, you know, occasionally we would, we would text each other and be like, and there was a time where Danny was like, Sarah, let's do something. <laughs> You know, like we, we actually felt like we really wanted to do something. And it was the same time I was starting to build a website for She Fighter Germany that Danny also happened to reach out to me. And it was just perfect timing. Again, it was one of those things that was like fate where we felt like we want to actively be doing something for women, um, regardless of where we're living, whether that's in the Middle East or in Europe or whatever the issues are. Um, I did get some questions from people asking me like, would that even work in Germany? Are women interested in a women's only course? Um, is there a need for it? I think you probably remember, Lena, there was a time we were in the Netherlands and uh, some woman said to you, yeah, I don't need self-defense. I'm, I'm not from the Middle East. And, oh yeah, she said And that. we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> As if, you know, <laughs> it's yeah. simply a Middle Eastern issue. Like in a way, I understand that guy, what he was saying to you is not just about the Middle East, but at the same time, course the Middle East mm. has an extra level of problems but it is actually a global issue and so um, we started it not sure of what would happen um, our first couple events we were in debt because you know we were charging such low prices because we just wanted people to show up um, but then word of mouth happened and people started spreading the message to their friends and we started having a um, photo image of what we were actually doing and the idea picked up uh, incredibly and now after the workshops, we always get all these emails and messages from the girls telling us how much it affected them and how much it affected their lives. And it's just, it's very, very rewarding work. So it's, um, uh, it's amazing. And these are like um, a story about a woman that joined, uh, you don't have to say her name or, but like kind of the training changed her life or she has suffered harassment or if, if anyone, like any of you want to share a story. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't believe how many women come to us that have a backstory. It's, um, I was surprised. Um, and some of them talk, but most of them don't. Um, so the stories behind them, we only know a few and we have some girls who return um, on a regular basis. And with some of them also like rape victims and abuse victims, we work on, on basics, just like screaming. Some of the girls can't scream, which is, um, it was so hard for me to believe in the beginning. Um, but this is one of the basics we work on and it's very, very important. And just last weekend in Berlin, we asked them, so what are you mostly proud of after the workshop? And over 50% of them said, I'm so proud of myself that I could scream. Um, and I mean, in a, in a case of where you have to defend yourself, screaming is always the, the first step, right? So um, yeah, I guess uh, um, some of the girls come to us for fitness and for networking, but a lot, a lot of them come because they have horrible backstories. Yeah, I, I think like people don't, you know, when we grow up, we're adults and everybody tells you, you know, to act and behave in a certain way. Screaming is one of them. Like you cannot just go scream. <laughs> you cannot, when you're angry, you cannot just, it's not like a baby, you know, babies scream all the time, but that's how you get everything inside out. And then it would not like the poison would not stay in. Um, you have to watch. Uh, so there's uh, online like uh, Red, Bull, Red Bull TV, if you heard about it. So it's just you write Red Bull TV, I think dot com, whatever. And uh, there's this guy who's a, a world champion in climbing. He started climbing since since he was a baby, and he was uh, he learned since he was a baby. Every time he fails, he would scream like crazy. Everybody will be like, 
you know, what's wrong with him? But he still grew up and every time he wouldn't catch the next like rock or he would scream like crazy. But everybody knows that that's who he is, but that's how he gets all the anger out at the moment. Like he wouldn't hide it in and then later on, it will become like poisonous in your body. Screaming is not just for, you know, like, uh, um, you know, when someone attacks you or it's it should be every single day. We even see all these, you know, like uh, drug addicts in the street. They scream too much. <laughs> they, they're always screaming, but because they don't care. I mean, it's, it's they're not in their heads, but I think it's a uh, human nature to scream and they, we should change the way we view screaming as it's something like, oh, they're mental health or they're crazy or they don't know what they do. No, we need to scream to let everything out and then you feel better by the way so tell us um how you're adapting with COVID-19 uh, and how did it affect your work and how did you change your strategy maybe Sarah oh <laughs> COVID. A lot of questions oh COVID <laughs> um COVID is very relevant right now because I was mentioning to you earlier like in Germany we're starting I think the numbers are higher than they've ever been at any point this year um, and so with Berlin also last weekend, we were unsure. It's just this, you know, when you're a, a small business and, and uh, you don't have all that funding or all that money as backup and you've got these events going, um, you're unsure what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, when it first started, we started doing online classes. So we adapted quite quickly, I would say. Um, and that helped us a lot, it helped us stay in touch with our community um, and for them to stay in touch with us. Um, and now with the events, like, you know, each event we did this year, the boot camp, the workshops now, each one is a gamble. So um, we just have to bear in mind that things may go to crap and uh, we may lose money. And uh, Danielle has been very good about making me, you know, get used to that fact that there will be times in our business career when we lose money. Um, and it's unfortunate, but so far we've been very lucky. The boot camp went through without a hitch. Uh, Berlin weekend also went through without a hitch. And now we've got Dresden coming up. So um, we've just got our fingers crossed because already, you know, the Corona regulations are starting to pick up over there. Um, and it's just this big question mark of 2020. What can you do and what can't you do? You plan everything and what's actually gonna go through? You don't know until the last second, mm -hmm. so. Um, it's, it's, it's been tough on everybody. But I think uh, yeah, gyms is still operating in Germany. Like they did not go on full lockdown, right? Yeah, yes, for the time being. Yeah. Oh, that's good. I mean, in Canada, everything is shut down. <laughs> yeah. That's why I like that's too much. People are protesting here. Um, but do you do like social distancing in the in the training? Do they? I think it's hard to put the mask on and play it and exercise. It's like it's completely like, it's like choke yourself faster, die. <laughs> um, we were, we had to limit the number of people that we could have. And normally we let people train uh, with different uh, partners all the time, but we kept everyone to their uh, same partner throughout the whole weekend rather than switching people up. And um, yeah, they did not have to wear the mask when training. That is the rule in Germany that when you're entering the fitness studio, when people are congregating in the entrance, they need to wear the mask. But once you reach the training area, you can take it off. Um, yeah. I personally was wearing it a little bit more because I'm going up into everyone's face. And so it was like, uh, just when I was going directly up to everybody, I was wearing it for that reason. But mm. normally when you're training in a gym in Germany, no, you don't need to wear um, the mask. Mm. No, here they give you like when they had the gyms open for like a few months, um, they were complaining about people showing up without masks in the gym. So they were, you know, um, yeah, it was uh, some people were like um, completely terrified about the mask, like they want to exercise in the mask. Um, but I think it's like you sweat on it, you breathe the same, you know, it's the same like you're, you exhale a, an air that should be, should leave your body, not <laughs> go back your buddy but anyway that's like i hope things would become better in 2021 um uh, i think canada they're debating if they're gonna go on to another lockdown i hope not you know they already shut down everything i mean do you want to shut down more things go ahead <laughs> doesn't really matter businesses are like all shutting down anyway 
Um, so Danny, tell, tell me more about, I've seen a picture of you on a motorbike. Do you drive motorbikes? Yes, I do. Really? What type? Uh, Harley Sportster. Oh, amazing. So when did you learn and when did you decide to just uh, ride <laughs> the motorbike? I wanted for years, but I never had the time because of my job. I travel a lot. So thanks to COVID, <laughs> I was stuck at home <laughs> since March. Um, so I said, okay, now or never. So uh, um, over the summer, I did my license and uh, from my savings, my very, very last savings, <laughs> I bought a motorcycle because life is short. So we better enjoy it. And yeah, I started riding and I really enjoy my new hobby. I'm thinking about uh, taking the license here. I have a license in Jordan. And a lot of people just, uh, it's like the pandemic. They're like, you're going to die if you get on it. <laughs> but when I came to Toronto, I met this badass women on motorbikes, you know? Like there is uh, this woman who's the director of women in one of the bi like biggest banks in Canada. And when you look at her, she's so like feminine and high heels. And suddenly she's like, I've been driving a motorbike for 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, tell me more about it. And then she connected me to this woman in Toronto um, who trains uh, people, you know, like women, how to ride motorbikes. Like she would go and train you in, and she's she's an like a woman founder of this motorbike company. And she just train you on how to ride different motorbikes. And I'm like, okay, I need to work on my Canadian license because Jordan license, uh, and it's different. The rules are different, and but they usually go in summer. Do you, you know, ride motorbike in in winter? It's registered uh, uh, the whole year, so I could I could ride whenever. But is it like risky with you know, you know, like rain well, when or it's pouring rain? Then you shouldn't, especially on the Harley. Um, it's hard to control when it's wet. Yeah. Um, but in general, you can. And I, I don't know why it's so weird that society thinks for women it's um, it's not okay to ride a motorbike. I, I really don't get it. But I think it's also it comes back to the way we're raised because they always tell a woman, oh, don't do that. That's dangerous. But when a man drives a motorcycle, that's perfectly fine. So I, it's the same risk. It's exactly the same risk. Doesn't yeah. matter if you have a penis or not. So I really, I'm, I'm surprised. I don't get it. <laughs> Um, and there are motorcycles that fit women like a little bit smaller, you know, and they're easier to handle. So what's the problem? And we ride the same way. It's basically, it's just, it's gears and it's gas and it's a brake. So I don't get the fuss. Girls yeah, but like motorcycles, it's fun. But what about you, Sarah? Do you think you want to go into that, like, ride like Danny, you know? Oh my gosh. When I saw her motorcycle, I was so, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Um, but when I had been in Jordan, actually... I, when I was thinking of buying a car, I told my parents, hey, I think I'm just going to buy a motorcycle instead because it's like cheaper, <laughs> more convenient. And you yeah. can imagine you know, how my dad reacted. <laughs> that's where okay, uh, you're gonna they used, what? <laughs> they, that's where they started screaming. <laughs> yeah, it was exactly what Danny just described. My mom was like, you're going to get yourself killed. You're going to die. It's dangerous. Um, my father mm -hmm. was like, that is absolutely not for a woman. <laughs> you know, like um, even growing up, like when you sit on a bicycle or something, they give you all this bullshit when you're a kid, like you're going to lose your virginity from the bike seat and all yeah. like that whole like um, sitting saddle style is inappropriate for a young lady. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah that's I, completely out of the question, but but now but we're not, again. yeah but we're not gonna talk a lot about you know virginity if we go there it's like a whole different topic because <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, I heard this TED talk that it's it's a whole myth of having like uh, something inside that is broken or anyway like you have to watch the TED talk because apparently it's just a myth <laughs> but be, because you know it's a patriarchal uh, societies who uh, define virginity and uh, how to take care of it and like with honor we're not going to go there but I would recommend people like watching a try if you want to try something light at the beginning try scooter <laughs> by the way scooter is like um, it's just uh, it's just so convenient and uh, you don't need a lot of gas and if if you're in a country that doesn't like uh, doesn't rain too much maybe, or it's not winter, I think get a scooter would be your your first. And then maybe try the motorbike if you don't want to go there. 
but it's just the most liberating, amazing feeling. You, uh, I think, sorry, you can try a scooter. <laughs> Will do. Yeah, <laughs> and then jump on Daniela's bike. So tell us uh, more about uh, uh, the new startup. Sarah, you want to? All right, Sarah it is. <laughs> okay, uh, Chinkilla is um, our brand new up and coming clothing brand. Yeah, Danny is wearing it today. Mine is in the laundry. Um, <laughs> but basically Danny and I are always talking about, uh, well, it was actually quite funny. There was a workshop that we had coming up and Danny ordered us both a pair of shorts from this German, uh, you know, martial arts clothing brand. And do you have Sarah link to it so I can write it on the chat box? Oh, for like Chinkilla? a website? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I can write, or if you want to do it uh, for people ahead, to it. check it. I but yeah, Danny uh... had uh, Danny had ordered us this pair of um, these like matching shorts, and they came. You know, on the website we thought they were fine, but when they came, they had sequins and like glitter all over them, and we're like, "Well, what the hell is that? We're not going to wear that." <laughs> So um, it was, that was kind of just the starting point. And then it just kept coming up in conversations between us where we were like, um, you know, this, this clothing that they're marketing towards us, it's always like either it's pink or it's glittery or it has sequins. It's not functional. It doesn't fit right. Like when mm. I go to the gym and I train uh, in my town here, is a bunch of guys and if I kick high then I'm flashing everybody my underwear because the shorts are just so short for women mm -hmm. and it's just we found so many problems with fitness clothing and especially martial arts clothing for women that um, we told ourselves well maybe the best way to fix this is to fix it ourselves so we started Chinkilla and you know, right now we don't have the funding for everything we want to do, but um, we started just simple with like hoodies and, and lifestyle clothing, and eventually we want to get onto like fight gear and stuff like that. So. And uh, how do people? Uh, how can people support you? Buy a hoodie. <laughs> get on the Make website and buy it. <laughs> yeah, basically every hoodie or every tank top um, we sell goes directly into the part of money we will use to manufacture martial arts clothes that actually fulfill our needs. So um, yeah, just <laughs> buy a hoodie if you want to support Chinkilla. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, you don't need more support? <laughs> Something else maybe, or just that's it? Well, I would say also follow us on Instagram. Follow us. <laughs> okay, so you can write it, Sarah, in the box, uh, the Instagram. Uh, yeah, go ahead and write it. And I'll write it when I post the interview later on. So thank you so much, Sarah and Daniela, for um, sharing everything on Saturday. It's a weekend. I know you, you both are exhausted. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you for your time and valuable uh, information. And for everybody watching, if you want more of this, please subscribe on our website, chiefwriter.com to get uh, like different guests or speakers every time about different topics, mostly concerning women, <laughs> focusing on women. Um, my next guest for next week is very interesting. You don't want to miss that. She has been in jail for 39 years uh, because she committed a crime in San Francisco Bay Area, but she said the prison saved her from getting killed. So don't miss that out and make sure you watch it next week. She's an amazing soul, amazing human being. It made me, like when I met her, it made me question the, the prison system. And we're gonna talk about this injustice inside the prison system because she's black and they used to release the white women faster than, than black. She even said, I, I did not know I'm gonna be, I was sentenced for life, um, but the white women leave faster. So she said like, uh, she's amazing. She's just amazing. And we were like, we're best friends now and make me, made me question about, about people com like making mistakes when they're kids. And um, you know, like we just never forget it when they grow up, especially like committing a crime. Like it's, so it, it's just, it's nice to hear it from her. So make sure you watch it next week and uh, enjoy your day everybody and have a nice weekend. Thank you, all. Thank you, Lena. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Daniela. Take care. Bye.